I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like, I Mix What I Like dot org at I Mix What I Like for all your relevant social media. I'm Jared Ball, happy to be your host. Uh, and for this conversation, I'm very excited to be talking to a longtime friend and comrade, Dr. Leslie Alexander, uh, who, among other things, is a professor in the Department of African American and African Studies at the Ohio State University, where she specializes in 19th century black culture and political consciousness. Uh, she teaches courses on slavery, resistance movements, and historical accuracy in film. Perfectly appropriate, obviously. Uh, and she is also, among other things, author of African or American, Black Identity and Political Activism in New York City, 1784 to 1861, which I do want to bring up in a few minutes because okay. I think what you did in that book is necessarily relevant to our, our forthcoming conversation, which okay. is about um, uh, Dr. Alexander's most recently published review of Nate Parker's film, Birth of a Nation, in The Nation magazine, uh, titled Birth of a Nation is an Epic Fail. Dr. Alexander, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's really good to see you. Likewise, likewise. Been too long. Um, and not enough time to get into all the things that we need to get into, obviously. <laughs> But let me right. just start with the big, broad question uh, for those who may not have read it or want to just know simply more about why the film, as you call it, is an epic fail. Right. Well, from my perspective, the real problem with the film, and honestly, the thing that really drove my desire to write the article, was all of the buzz that I was hearing about the film, and people kept talking about how they were really excited to hear the real story of Nat Turner, and they were really excited to, you know, hear the history behind um, the rebellion, behind Nat Turner's life. People actually seemed really caught up and passionate about the idea of finally hearing Nat Turner's real story. And of course, as a historian, whenever I hear that, that always makes me cringe a little bit because we all know that a Hollywood film is not the same thing as a documentary. Right. So a Hollywood film is never going to be perfectly historically accurate. And I want to be clear about the fact that I get that right. too, you know, even as a historian. So and documentaries aren't necessarily either, by the way, just, right. just no, exactly. but, but your point is well taken. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, right. Nothing is ever historically accurate. Historical sources always have problems. Documentaries have problems. So I never go into a Hollywood film hopeful that it's going to be perfectly historically accurate. Um, but in this case, Nat Turner's story um, as a person, but also as the leader of what we now know, of course, was the bloodiest slave rebellion in U.S. history. That's a that's an extremely important story, especially for me as a historian of black resistance. And so there was a, a part of me that felt like I actually wanted um, it was important to me how this particular story was depicted. And so I, w I actually went into the film, despite the controversy and all of that, I still went into the film feeling really hopeful about the story the film was going to tell, about the potential importance of the film, um, the way in which it might even open a, a national conversation about slavery. A number of my friends who I said that to laughed at me and called me naive that like I thought, it you know, they sort of thought I was ridiculous for feeling hopeful about the potential that this film might have. But I actually went into the film with, as I described it recently to a friend, with an open mind and a hopeful heart, you know, feeling really hopeful about what this film might still have the potential to do. But when I went into the film, what I saw was um, a story that had absolutely nothing to do with the, the actual life of Nat Turner and had precious little to do. I think at this point I've maybe counted three or four actual historical facts that the, the film got right in terms of the revolt itself. And so it really started to bother me that what we were going to have was a, a whole country of film goers who left the theater feeling like they understood something about slavery, that they understood something about Nat Turner's life, that they understood something about the revolt, when in fact what was being depicted in the film had very little to do with what actually transpired. Well, so, okay, so one of the things I wanted to do was, as we talked a little bit before off air, I did go on Facebook earlier and let people know we were going to be conducting this interview and I invited some suggestions on questions and the ones that I've collected here, you know, largely mirror some of the conversation I've seen elsewhere 
<clears throat> both about, you know, in response to your review and, and uh, you know, comment, just general commentary elsewhere and other people's reviews. Right. And and your point about the, the, the historical accuracy or lack thereof is, is obviously one of the big, big questions that's brought up. Um, and one of the questions that I have here that I think is, is a good, you know, uh, example of, of these kinds of critiques or questions is, is if Parker's film is, quote, historically inaccurate, as you say, what historical record is the measuring stick? Is it William Styron? Uh, narratives. I hope not. You know, no. <laughs> I think we can agree it's not William. Right, Byron. right, right. Uh, <laughs> we can agree on that. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, narratives from enslaved folks who were there, perhaps passed down orally in families. What historical record and whose? And if I would add to that, you know, one of the problems with this topic is that there isn't a lot of, right. a, you know, a clear firsthand accepted primary documentation on on Nat Turner. So, what what is for you, or how is it that you've come to determine that this film is is inaccurate? Right. I think that's a really good question and it's a fair one. And it's an important one because as you pointed out in this story, as with a lot of 19th century, mm. you know, black history, we don't necessarily have the broad and deep source base that we would like. Yeah. So that's one of the challenges for those of us who study um, this time period. But I think, I, again, I definitely want to underscore the fact that William Styron's yeah. <laughs> conventions would not be a source I would use. Um, I, a number of people have pointed out, and I have always agreed with this as well, um, that uh, Thomas Gray's right. um, confessions are also highly problematic. I will point out that there actually are some details in the confessions, in um, Thomas Gray's confessions, that are confirmed by other historical right. sources. Um, but as a document in totality, we can't take that, right, as the gospel either. Right. Um, so what we have to do, as, for those of us who study the 19th century, is to look at multiple sources and look at points where we see commonality and convergence and overlap. So you have to actually be willing to look at multiple sources. You have to look at um, newspaper articles. You have to look at, uh, you have to listen to the oral history, you know, that's passed down in families. You have to um, look at the court records, you know, you have to look at everything that's out there um, and then actually be willing to sort of look at those in comparison with each other and see where there are sort of points of commonality or um, convergence. Very recently, I posted on my um, Facebook page a source that I, you know, think is, is particularly useful, which is actually a website called, um, I think it's natturnerproject.org, mm -hmm. um, which is an online resource that has collected a lot of the primary source um, materials. And a, no a number of people have written to me since the article kind of saying, well, where can I find the true story? And I've recommended a few books um, written by historians, but I actually also have directed people specifically to this um, website. So my suggestion is look at the primary sources and decide for yourself. You know, I think that's what we should be encouraging people to do is to reach their own conclusions. You know, but the other part of that question, implicit or sometimes explicitly stated is, you know, what does it matter? You know, so so part of the, the, the criticism I saw that you were getting uh, that others have gotten, uh, myself even to a lesser extent, is yeah. why all the focus on whether it's accurate or not? We get a good story that features black people and, uh, you know, in heroic ways and rebellion you know, yeah. one good friend of mine, you know, was was satisfied just at the one white severed head, you know, <laughs> like that was enough for him. He was like, everything else, I'm good if I got that. You know, yeah. um, shouldn't we be good with that? Or, you know, why isn't that enough? Yeah, well, I mean, Jared, you've known me a long time. So you know that I'm never going to be like mad at a good rebellion story. <laughs> right, you know, right, I mean, right. I'm, I'm definitely down <laughs> for a film that actually, you know, depicts that and depicts that well. So I'm never going to be mad about that. Um, and I have also heard a number of people kind of say, oh, historical accuracy, that's just really, why are you being so overly intellectual and eggheady? And that's the problem with all you, you know, historians sitting up in the ivory tower, right, checking right. off little historical accuracy boxes. But, you know, for, I will just speak for myself and say that for me, the historical accuracy is not just about hyper intellectualism. It's not about like sitting in my little ivory tower and, you know, clicking off boxes. For me, it's about whether or, no, whether or not we as Black people, as people of African descent, are actually ever going to come to a point where we have enough respect for our own history mm. to insist upon the telling of our stories. 
in a holistic and an honest um, fashion and one that actually really tells our stories. And that's a lot of what I've been hearing. I'm actually not a, a big social media person. So the truth is I haven't been following a lot of the chatter. Um, but one of the big things that I have, you know, heard is, um, you know, I, like you were saying, why does this actually matter? And my point is, it actually matters because people are wandering around saying, well, it tells our story. If it's not Nat Turner's story, it's still telling our story of slavery. And my answer is no, it actually isn't. It's not telling our story. It's not telling Nat Turner's story. It's not the only story it's telling is Nate Parker's story. And I feel like at some point, black people need to get to the point where we're willing to insist upon the importance of, if we don't respect our own history, how are we to expect anyone else to? And so we have to come to a point where we're willing to respect our own history enough to insist upon the actual telling of our stories in the way that they happened. And I feel like in the case of Nat Turner, you know, if we want Nat Turner to be considered an American hero, quote unquote, right? Or a hero of any kind, right? And a hero within our community, then why don't we give him the respect that a hero deserves, right? Which is the true telling of his story. You know, I don't think that we should be so um, lax about just allowing any old story, you know, um, to be told about us. We want our actual story to be told. And we should demand that. We should have enough respect for ourselves and our history to demand that. Well, you know, part of the problem, I think, is you brought out in your your uh, review is that one, Nate Parker has been promoting this as a, a document that is, um, you know, true to history, that, right. that he wanted to be uh, as accurate as possible and tell the story as it really was. And right. as you also point out, that one of the problems with with the inaccurate telling of history are the ways in which the story is filled in. Uh, by the storyteller, so it's it's not just that you don't tell the real history, but it's the version that is also presented that I that I have a little bit of an issue with that I think you you bring up as well. Exactly. That is similar to you know so sort of what you also brought up in your in your last response is is a point you made and you raised in your essay that that um, especially in dealing with uh, women and his own particular troubled history with women right. that you you raise the issue that 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 Nate Parker in not only recreating an inaccurate telling of, of Nat Turner's story is in a way addressing his own issues with women and his own past with women, not only in the rape scene of, of Turner's wife, but in the, in the portrayal of women in general. Uh, so could you say a little bit about that? Because some of the questions that we got and that I've seen in the discussion have centered around not only your approach to the issue of masculinity and femininity and the role of women, uh, but this question of why did why did she and others why did she you know join others in bringing up uh, Parker's history and this whole rape case and all this other stuff what is that you know she's joining the white supremacist in fact as one person said lynching of of uh, Parker so a lot I brought up there um, trying to to you know weave in a segue here um, but the, but if you would the issue of women Nate Parker's retelling or projecting his own story. What is it that you're saying there or think should be said about all of that? Well, I guess the first thing that I want to say is that, you know, I the one of the other things that I have heard said about me um, in in social media is, um, you know, that I'm trying to take Nate Parker down and, you know, that I'm, you know, you, I'm hiding behind issues of historical inaccuracy and other criticisms about the film because what I really want to do is take him down because of, you know, the conflict over the controversy and um, the deplorable things that he's done in his past. And I guess I do want to clear that up by simply saying that I don't hate Nate Parker. <laughs> um, I don't hate black men. I'm not trying to take Nate Parker or any other black man down. Um, I consider myself a nationalist, a black nationalist. I consider myself a pan-Africanist. Um, I am married to a revolutionary black man, so I love revolutionary black men. Um, for me, the article was really not driven by any of those things that people would like to believe that it was driven by. My concern about the article, and I, I do want to sort of emphasize that my concern about the depiction of black women is one of many historical inaccuracies right, um, right. that I was concerned about. And when you're writing an article like this, 
you're given like they actually originally told me 1500 words. They gave me a few more. <laughs> um, but you have to try to squeeze everything you want to say into that space. That's and nice. so I had actually written a 4000 word article in which I talked a lot about a number of the other historical inaccuracies that I had concerns about. And it eventually got pared down to that. So, um, you know, my the the issue about the way black women were depicted is a real concern for me. And I'll, I'll say something more about that in a minute. But I certainly did not want, did not intend, did not desire for this article to become a conversation that pits black men against black women. That is, you know, anti-revolutionary. It's against everything I stand for. Hopefully, if people read the section of the article that talked about the types of movies about slavery that I would like to see, um, you would see that what I was really saying is, is that what I would like to see are stories about black people, whether they be about slavery or otherwise, right? Stories about black people that show us united mm -hmm. as a community, struggling against white supremacy, struggling against all of the various oppressions, right, that we have faced historically and contemporarily. And all I was really trying to say about the film is that it is not only not helpful for our contemporary struggle, but it all is also historically inaccurate to depict the story of black struggle against slavery as one in which women were always passive victims and men were always the rescuing heroes. That just isn't the reality of the story. And that's not to say that men were black men were never rescuing heroes. Right. Sometimes they were, <laughs> right? But sometimes black women also stood shoulder to shoulder, right, with their um, black brothers to fight for our liberation as well. As it turns out, in the case of Nat Turner's rebellion, um, there uh, there is very little evidence to suggest that women actually took up arms um, in that particular rebellion. So I'm not suggesting that he should have fabricated right, right a storyline of of black women having done that in this case. Um, although it's obvious he didn't have a problem with fabrication. <laughs> right, well, that's um, true but, too, right? But I'm not suggesting he should have done that. What I am suggesting is that taking up arms was one way to fight against the institution of slavery. And black women used a variety of methods. Mm -hmm. In some cases, they took up arms, but they also fought back against slavery in other ways. And it would have been perfectly easy and I think totally appropriate to weave some of those storylines into it. And that's why I tried to point out what the historical record reveals about Nat Turner's mother, because right. she didn't necessarily take up arms in the 1831 revolt, but she fought back against slavery in a variety of ways. It would have been really easy to weave in a storyline like that. Um, so you don't think it was enough if some have, as some have suggested that we see the mother encouraging him saying she's proud of him and then the wife giving him permission to, 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 uh, you know, go, you know, avenge her. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly why I'm supposed to be excited about yeah. that. Like, I mean, it's just lost on me. Like, yeah. maybe someone could explain to me why I should feel satisfied with that. But mm -hmm. again, I don't feel like there there's no reason to not also include the variety of other ways, not just black women standing on the sidelines going, you go, honey, good right. job, right. right? Right. But the variety of ways in which women found creative and dynamic ways to fight back against um, the institution of slavery, arson, poisoning, infanticide, right? There's a whole variety of ways, um, sometimes even just talking back and being sassy, right? <laughs> right? right. Um, that black women use to fight against um, slavery. So yeah, I, personally, I'm not sure why I'm supposed to be excited about a storyline in which the women are standing on the sidelines clapping, you know, as their men go right off to revolt. You know, one of the, the you, you just touched on it, that, that the film obviously is fine taking some poetic license in, in, in some parts and apparently doesn't want to in others. Like you said, they, they could have easily turned this into, you know, taking poetic license and incorporated all of these uh, examples into to this rebellion uh, depicted on film. Um, but I want to use this instance to, to quickly try to make a point that I want to see made and connect it to your previous work, as I as I said I would. So so bear Actually, with before me. You answer, before you ask the question, sure. can I say one other no, thing? No, please, go ahead, yeah. 
which is that just for anyone who like wants to continue to believe that like I have been like on a blinded mission to take down Nate Parker, I would encourage you to go online and look um, for a panel that is actually posted on um, the Wexner Center at the o at OSU on their website that actually shows that there's a two hour panel that I sat on um, the night before I saw the film. Mm. And if people take, I realize it's two hours, <laughs> you don't have to watch the whole thing, but if you watch that panel, what you will actually hear me say is that I find what I understand about the story of Nate Parker's past to be disturbing and deplorable, and that I have not been particularly encouraged by the way he has handled it um, in the media since then. But I also said that I was hopeful, that I was encouraged, that I was inspired um, by the potential of the film and that I was going into it still hopeful and that I was feeling torn by what do you do with a situation where um, you're concerned about the person's past, but you also feel really hopeful about the potential of the film. And what happened is I went to go see the film and I just didn't think the film was very good. Right, like right. it was not historically accurate. It also just, in my opinion, wasn't that great of a film. So, you know what I mean? And there that was also the, I, I, and I think I forgot to follow up on this, but you also made another point in your review about him projecting his own issues with his own past experience uh, with, with the, the rape allegation or accusation or, or uh, um, and, and the way it's depicted on film. Uh, yeah. The scene with with Turner's wife is, is is there something you would want? Could you bring that into this a little bit, real I mean, quick? You know, I'm, yeah. I'm a historian. Mm -hmm. I'm not a psychologist. Right, you right, know what right, I mean? So that's right. why I kind of said I'm going to leave this to other people right, you know, right. to decide for themselves. I'm not going to try to, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay in my lane, right, right and talk right. about what I know, which is which is history. But I will just say that I think there is something a little interesting, right, about the fact that he decided to use multiple rapes because obviously Cherry is is one. And of course, there's a debate about was Cherry really raped in the movie or was she not? But other people in the film were, right? So he uses rape multiple times in um, the film, despite the fact that, you know, again, there is there is absolutely not a shred of historical evidence to suggest that rape played a role in driving the revolt. Like, was slavery, uh, was um, rape widespread during slavery? Of course, right? But in terms of serving as an impetus for the revolt or as a, a revenge for the revolt, there is no evidence to suggest that. So it does make you wonder. I will just say it makes me wonder, mm. right? why you why um Nate Parker decided to make that such a pivotal issue um in the film you know that's so actually that actually helps me with with the segue I was trying to make as well okay. because for me the film gives too much credit to Christianity as a mm -hmm. reason for the rebellion yeah. Um, and I think to the detriment of the broader tradition of of rebellion that Turner was clearly aware of, whether it's from his father's uh, history as a maroon right. or being a literate preacher who travels around and would hear about all the things that have happened or read about what was happening, including David Walker's appeal. And all, I mean, all these, you know, so the idea that only Christianity or only, you know, this this uh, fictitious rape uh, would right. would inspire it or be the leading cause. Ah. And I know that some people who have responded to your piece and even to my uh, critique on this point have, have said that the film uh, actually shows uh, memories of Turner, flashbacks of Turner, of all these other horrific things that he's seen as also impetus for, for the, for the rebellion. But I felt like that was a little bit downplayed uh, versus the Christianity. And as you, as you point out this rape, Right. So let me. So this is what I wanted to try to do. So so everybody, bear with me on this little bit of a long question, but I I think it'll make sense in just a minute. So okay. So on the one hand, I'm saying that I think the film disassociates Turner from the righteous tradition of struggle, and then falsely attaches him by film's end and final scene as being part of a very different and antithetical tradition, mm -hmm. that of the myth of American exceptionalism, desire for freedom and democracy. So that scene where he goes from the boy who's the traitor. And I love how you pointed out, and I didn't we catch it. We need to talk about that. We need to talk about that scene, but keep going. Let's, yeah, so, but 
<laughs> because I loved how you pointed out that that, and I didn't catch this until reading it again for this interview. That you point out specifically that nobody associated with the rebellion was the snitch, right? And I and, and so I want to put a pin in that also, just real, because I think that's that's part of my point here also. Um, right. Let's come back to that. So, and I think I actually say that here. In fact, the boy who uh, um, who who you were correctly referred to as being falsely implicated as the plot's traitor both aids the switching of traditions by suggesting the treachery came from within. So I, right. yeah, that's, a, yeah, within the revolt. And then that the boy being shown as a grown man fighting for the union reattaches Nat Turner's rebellion to this, you know, linear progression from enslavement to what we are now with happiness and democracy, freedom and equality. Right. 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 Um, and then, uh, in fact, I credit you with helping me reach this conclusion, even if it isn't yours. And I don't want to put this on you. Okay. Because in your previous work, in this book, uh, you talk about Henry Highland Garnett, the oh, convention that's, that's of 18... Eight... book. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I appreciate that. But also, the, the, specifically, the convention of 1843 and his mm-hmm. call that almost wins, that, that, that all the enslaved rise up as Turner did. Yes. Uh, that there be this openly called for armed resistance insurrection in mass. Uh, and that this is the tradition, I think, that the film removes, intentionally or not. At least it's the reason why I think Sundance was happy to pick it up, consciously or not. So can you talk about that a little bit? I wanted you to, to, to talk a little bit about maybe that convention, what Garnett was arguing, and yeah. maybe, you know, what maybe add a little more to the point I'm trying to make, that there was this, this bigger conversation happening. Yes before and after Turner that doesn't appear in the film. Yes. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, that's a lot. (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know. (laughs) No, but it's all, it's super important. So I'm glad you brought it up. I want to go back to, I want to start with the point about the boy Mm -hmm. in the film who betrays the rebellion. Because I think there's another piece to that that I find really upsetting. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, something that I actually wrote. I went on a long rant about this in the first draft of the essay. And the rant was so long that it had to be cut. But I still think I'm going to do something with it eventually. Um, And that is, this is my read of what happened in that situation. And obviously, film is open to interpretation. But my read of what happened um, in with that storyline with the young boy is is as follows. And I do, before I go into it, I do want to point out again, that boy never existed. (laughs) He never betrayed the rebellion, nor did any other black person. Okay. They fought to the bitter end. The militia caught up with them. Right. And then the group splinters and a whole bunch of other things, right. Happen from there, but there was no snitch. Right. And it was definitely not that little boy. (laughs) Okay. The, here's the way it plays out in the film, and the, if, in my view, how it plays out in the film, and what well, I sorry, find. Just real quick, so Turner, what I thought, see, I did I, help me out because I thought he was snitched on by someone black, not associated with the rebellion, who told on him for hiding out in the woods and led the the captors to him. But I, I'm, I apparently have that wrong too. So please, no. continue. yeah, okay, good, uh, good. What, what, what actually happens in that situation is that Nat Turner hides out. Mm-hmm. The, I will, let me say this, because I do want to acknowledge the film got some things right. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that the film got really right and that I was happy about, of course, it didn't come to the end. So by then I was so mad, I almost didn't even care. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing that the film got, got right is that following the rebellion, right, after the militia comes in and puts the rebellion down, there is a massive anti-black wave of violence, right? Right. In which all of those folks are lynched and hanged, they're shot, they're tortured. I mean, there was a a brutal wave of violence, right? And that one scene, right, that I think everyone loves where Mm. Cherry is saying they're just killing, you know, they're killing black folks just for being black. You know, that actually did happen. I mean, I don't know that she said that, right? But, um, you know, that that wave of vi- anti-black violence, right, in which people who were actually not even associated with the revolt at all mm-hmm. right, were tortured, maimed, killed, hanged, right, the whole thing. So that actually did happen. That was true. Part of the reason, I mean, part of the reason it happened is because the revolt happened, right? right? right. But the other part of the reason why that happened is because Nat Turner was hanging out, h- hiding out, right? He was still at large, Um, And in fact, as the film depicts, he was hiding relatively close to the plantation where Cherry was enslaved. 
Um, it appears from the historical records that he actually never traveled more than about a mile from that right. location. Um, so he was hiding out for about six weeks. And essentially what happens is a hunter is going through the woods, stumbles upon the cave and finds him. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, you're, that's right. Yeah. Right. So there was no snitching that happened. So for me, that was actually one of the really frustrating things about the film was um, as my, actually my husband is the one who put it this way afterwards. He says the message that film is sending us is that black people cannot trust each other. Right. When it matters most. And so I had a huge problem with that. Like it really did send a clear and unequivocal message like black people, you know, black people are going to snitch on you. Yeah. You know what I mean? So don't try to get yourself caught up in some kind of revolt because you're going to end up getting killed because another black person is going to dine you out. Right. You know what I mean? So that was upsetting to me. But um, the other part that was upsetting to me is what you just touched on, which is the way that the I feel like the way the storyline with that young boy unfolds is this. He's brought into the original fold, right, of the original organizers. He's kind of on board with them and he's rolling with the revolt all the way up until that all, all the way up until that scene you just mentioned. Right. It, where the one brother goes in, he obviously is really trying to like, he's got some issues. He's trying to work out with his former master. Right, right. right. <laughs> he goes in there, right? He brings him out and he's decapitated, right? The way it appeared to me in the film is that that violence was too much for the little kid, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. At that point, he's like, oh. This revolt has gone too far. Yeah, now it's really real. Right, right. right. So now it's really real. It's gone too far. These rebels are out of control. That level of violence is too much. All this killing is too much. Right. And so now I have to go tell. Right. <laughs> right. So it's not just that he snitched. Right. But it's also that he snitched because he mm. felt like the rebellion was too strong. It was too much. Right. And when in his in the little boy's view, the rebels cross when they crossed the line in his mind. Right. Now, all of a sudden, I have to go tell. Right. So my point is, is that the film is also sending subtle messages about what form your rebellion is supposed That's to right. take. That's right. Right. That's right. You're allowed to be mad up until a certain point. That's right. Right. But when you get too mad, now there's a problem. And that same old thing, you can kill your enemy if he is the state's enemy and we put you in our uniform first. Right, right. Which now is you can go right kill. Go, right? Yeah. He tells because the rebellion's too much, mm -hmm. right? So he goes and tells. The rebellion gets crushed. All the people who rebelled too strongly, right, all get their punishment. And then he does the right thing. The little boy, right? He becomes the hero in the story because he did the right thing. He snitched when the rebels went too far. Mm. And then he put on a Union uniform mm. and went marching off to war under the American flag. I mean, is that, that's, yeah, that's, so look. We, I, mean, we, I could say more, but honestly, I don't feel like there's more to say. I don't know. Yeah, there, there's no more else to say. <laughs> so I, I do want to, I, I want to move on only because of time. I, I want to get to at least one other issue. Um, <laughs> just, just everybody rewind that and listen to that again. Cause that was, that was, <laughs> but, but you know, this, this question of, you know, even going back to your book's title, uh, African or American, yeah. uh, this question of, of the Africanisms in the film, uh, again, I thought they were too soft to yeah. in the background, too subservient to the dominance of Christianity. Yeah. But some have pointed out that they did accurately use some Twee language. Yes. Um, some other Africanisms appeared in the film. Yeah. So how do you judge that? And then this critique that we talked about, you know, off air of that uh, came of you that, that because that your approach to the masculine feminine question was also too Eurocentric, that the, that the Africanness of the film wasn't, by you and others being appreciated enough. Right. Well, okay. I, I will say, let me start first with the part about the sort of nod to Africanity mm -hmm. um, in the film. That was actually, again, in an, in an earlier, much longer <laughs> version right. of the article. I actually did have a section where I talked about a few things that I thought the film did well. Um, and I did point out that um, I appreciated the fact that they tried to incorporate um, some aspects of acknowledging right that um african culture and that forms of african spirituality were part of the enslaved 
um, community. Very personally, I felt like the representations that were in there, and I conveyed this to you uh, offline, mm-hmm. I felt like they were a little trite, mm-hmm. um, a little simplistic, um, a little ripped off from other films, <laughs> right? Um, but I appreciated the fact that he tried to include something about that. It didn't necessarily right. take the form I most would have liked to see, but I appreciated the fact that an effort was made to acknowledge, right, the presence of African culture and spirituality in the film. Um, I do agree with you, though, that I felt like um, symbolically in the film, the message was sent, like, well, they turned away from that and embraced Christianity, right? Which, again, is is a bit ahistorical, mm-hmm. because if you look at um, really the practice of Christianity among enslaved people, what you see is that Christianity became very Africanized, right? <laughs> right? That right. Christianity practiced by enslaved people was by and large um, blended with African spiritual traditions, right? right? So that the strict delineation between African spirituality and Christianity, right, is a little bit of a false dichotomy. Right. In the sense that it was much more sort of fluid and overlapping right during that period. Yeah. Well, listen, there's a lot more that, that to get into, but I appreciate you taking this much of the time uh, of your time to talk about uh, your work in the film. More broadly speaking, I, I hope we can do this again at some point, Ooh, especially my- given that, you you know, you're as you said, your social media, uh, you know, arm's length, uh, you know. Yeah, I get, har- I get harassed a lot about that. My my social media arm is not long. I'm right. I'm an you know again you've known me a long time. Mm-hmm. I'm an in person person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'll sit down and rap with you all day long. You know, but I don't like to sit behind a computer screen and try to clack away at people. You it's, know, it, I mean? it, it's so. better that way, and and we appreciate it. Uh, but, and and I'm glad you you were joining us. So, Dr. Leslie Alexander, thank you very much for joining us in this edition of I Mix What I Like and. To you, as we always say, uh, uh, as Fred Hampton used to say, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, and we'll catch you in a whirlwind. Peace. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.